We continue onwards with the snails, with the what we call gastropods now. So still within the phylum mollusca. So phylum mollusca class gastropoda. So gastro referring to belly, poda is foot. So how do these things move around? They literally crawl on their belly, on their belly foot, if you want to think of it that way. So gastropoda includes things like your snails. Um, both the, the terrestrial snails are slugs, terrestrial and aquatic slugs. We call those nudibranchs. Um, pretty diverse group. So about 75,000 um, living species. Um, we'll talk about this torsion in a bit, kind of a strange uh, development of their digestive system. Uh, the operculum, if you are a, a little snail, right? And, and you're crawling around and you're, you, you have your protective shell around you. When you retract in, uh, you, you're still vulnerable, right? Your door is still open basically. So the operculum is a little protective shield that they use to seal up that opening. So a predator can not easily kind of just crawl into that shell. So it's a, it's a modification on the foot that's used as a, uh, a protective barrier to close the shell. Um, so what's the difference between a snail and a slug? Uh, the snails basically is a slug with a shell. So there's the snail, uh, it's got a protective shell. It, it can't crawl out of the shell. The shell is literally fused to its body. Um, the, the slug basically has a very modified, very reduced shell. It's not actually a, a shell, calcium carbonate shell. It's just this leathery patch. And again, they just crawl around without it, that protective shell. They need to remain in moist conditions. Um, uh, doesn't seem as well protected, but they have a lot of slime that basically makes them kind of um, not necessarily that edible. So gastropoda snails can range, snails and slugs can range in size from, you know, very small, one millimeter to over 60 centimeters, so about two feet long. So again, that is an actual life, real life size of, a, of these snails. Um, they come in different shapes depending on their ecology. Right here we have the long slender snails. Here we have a very spiked form of a, of a snail very smooth, so you can venture to guess what different challenges they would have, where they would live with these different types of shells. Um, and again, just uh, uh, depending on their ecology, what they're interacting with, their evolutionary history has produced all of these modifications of the shells. Uh, if you were to cut the shell in half, you can see that whorl where it kind of whorls where that snail can kind of retract in or retract out. Retract in, retract out. I uh, mentioned this a little bit before in, in prior lectures, but uh, we get now into the, um, the group, the class that has the most well-developed radulas. So when you think of snails crawling around the garden, um, what are they feeding on? They're feeding on uh, vegetative matter, on, on organic matter. Uh, they don't have an actual uh, chewing mouth. They don't have teeth, but they have this, this radula that can go in there and scratch and scrape. And, and uh, it's, uh, again, it's defined as a rasping protrusible organ, uh, has sharp chitinous teeth. Uh, and so again, it's going to shave and scrape uh, food from, you know, from whatever's edible there that they can feed upon. So the radula basically Again, it produces, it lubricates itself. Um, there's some harpooning uh, modifications on some of the venomous snails. Um, it, it's, a, it's found in all mollusks except the bivalves. However, it's highly modified in some of the others. It's not a, a rasping, sc uh, scraping organ. It, it, it's it's going to have a different purpose later on. So again, here's the mouth. There's the radula. So that radula kind of like a little chainsaw scraping action. Chainsaw scraping action will scrape against whatever's feeding on and the little fragments in are moved 
into the mouth. You just the generic sort of body plan again of the, of the mollusks. There's our circular nerve ring, two bifurcations of the nerves, open circulatory system. Again, just a little bit more detail. And this starts to give us an insight into the idea of torsion. Right? So torsion is, is, a, is kind of an odd development. When we think of a worm digestive system, we have the mouth on one end and then the anus on the other end. Right? So it's kind of a long linear process. And that's kind of how they begin in early development. But then, and again, I don't necessarily understand why, just it happened evolutionarily the way that it works. It helps, I guess, to, to kind of coil that the shell. Uh, but we have this torsion process in which the digestive system basically folds 180 degrees. So they eat from this side and they actually poop from the same side, not the same opening, but from the same side. So food comes in this side, waste goes out also this side. It's not on the opposite side of the body. Of the body. So it would seem like, uh, to me, like more logical, just you eat here, you poop on this side, but that's not how it happens. Again, they eat here, we have torsion, and they basically poop. If you really analyze it, they're, they're pooping on the back of their necks. They're, they're urinating, they're pooping on the back of their necks, and that is going to have a double purpose. Uh, it makes it maybe not as edible, and it also will help keep it moist. So it's a lubricating type of process as well. So this torsion in the gastropods. So mouth on one end, and kind of pooping on their backs there in their necks. So now transitioning from torsion to food, right? So snails are viewed uh, commonly as, as a food source, right? I don't know if any of y'all have tried escargot, right? And again, if you're going to order it, you got to sound intellectual. You don't pronounce the T, right? It's a French term, escargot. I personally have never tried escargot. I don't know if I'm missing something in life. I just, it doesn't really interest me that that much that much to try it maybe some of you can vouch man it's a it's a delicious meal something like that i don't know but um yeah just have a slight just a matter of principle an organism that that pees and poops on itself to stay moist and eh, just doesn't attract me i know it's cooked and all that stuff but um no but maybe you know let me know email me whatever that hey yeah it's really delicious it's really good stuff or it's nasty you know i don't i don't know now, again, I do focus a lot on venomous species, and we have about, uh, depends on the taxonomy, there's, there's a few different species of what we call conus, the cone snails. So the cone snails have really, really modified their radula into a functional harpoon with a very, very potent venom. So these are predatory snails. Uh, they feed on fish, they feed on other you know, aquatic organisms. And again, the, the venom is very serious. If, if you were to be stung by one of these, you would be in a, you know, it's a medical emergency for sure. We don't have these in the United States. You got to go off you know, to the coast of Australia. Uh, but that's where we would find these really hot, highly modified, very unique snails. And I'll, I'll, I'll upload a, a video that, that kind of uh, mentions them a little bit more. Another one that I think is really neat, uh, really ingenious, is the nudibranchs. Uh, these are slugs, shellless snails uh, that live in the marine, in, in oceanic waters, right? So nudie, without naked, without clothes. Um, so re referring to they're without a shell, right? So you're a shellless, soft-bodied, um, sort of invertebrate crawling around the tide pools in the ocean that makes you very low on the food chain. So they don't have their own shell. So what they do uh, is actually quite ingenious, right? And I don't really have a really good picture to illustrate this, but uh, these are different species of nudibranchs. If you notice, they have like these little extensions on their body. And those extensions, these extensions are not necessarily generated on, on their own. Kind of got to elaborate that a little bit. 
So if we go back and we talk about the, uh, the Cnidarians, the sea uh, uh, the, the, the venomous uh, cnidocytes, well, there's a trick that these nudibranchs do. They will carefully scrape off the, the cnidocytes, these uh, stinging cells of the cnidarians. They ingest them, but they don't digest them, right? And then by the process of active transport, they move them from their digestive system to these little fleshy extensions on their back. So uh, they are literally stealing the ammunition from cnidarians to place on their backs. So if I was to pick up a nudibranch with my hand, it would be the exact same as me grabbing a, a jellyfish, right? It's the same nidocytes that I would get stung with as these. Although the nidocytes don't come from, they're not produced by these snails by these slugs, they're stolen from the cnidarians. Right? So it's a, a, a neat trick. How they ingest them without being stung, uh, that, that's quite amazing. And how the radula carefully um, you know, extracts them without damaging these nidocytes is quite amazing as well. So again, a really colorful group trying to highlight and illustrate and advertise that they are toxic. Don't mess with me, leave me alone. And again, it, it's uh, they're they're neat a neat category of um, of mo of mollusks of cephalopods for sure. I'm gonna get too much into the larvae, but with that, let me uh, let me stop this one, and then I'll address then the last group, the cephalopods. Really, really neat category.